Uh, when Marcus asked me to talk, he said the topic was smart cities and ethics. Um, so I decided to talk about smart cities and ethics and not so much about sidewalk labs. Um, but I will say a little bit is about sidewalk because I do get asked by the mandarins in City Hall what my opinion is. Uh, my opinion is very simple. I think this is a very important experiment, and I was happy to hear Ruben use the word experiment over and over and over. And to the extent that we lose sight that this is an experiment, then we will fail in this experiment. Because we will take whatever comes out of it as the result, as opposed to the confirmation or refutation of particular hypotheses that we may be exploring. And so the question then is, if this is an experiment, what are the hypotheses going to be? How are we going to confirm and refute them? And so as John was saying about affordable housing, it's not just, should we, it, we should not be saying we're going to provide affordable housing. The question is, what are the hypotheses around the best ways to provide affordable housing? How are we going to confirm and refute these hypotheses? And if we don't articulate this, the sidewalk uh, lack of, as an experiment, then we are doomed to failure because everybody has their own opinion in the end, subjectively, as to what the outcomes were and whether they were good or bad, and we will have no way to answer them if we don't start day one in articulating the hypotheses, the processes, and the metrics by which we're going to measure things. Now, I'm not saying that they're not doing it, I'm just saying publicly if we don't say that over and over and over again, then we lose the war of words on this. And so when I think about smart cities, and the next part of my presentation is going to be what is a smart city since nobody has talked about it yet. Um, when I think about smart cities, again, just recently another a journalist asked me, he was interviewing me about smart cities, and of course because I'm on the computer science engineering side, they want me to talk about information communication uh, communication technology as the basis of smart cities, uh, I said to him it was, very, um, it was very simple. The three key pieces that underlie any smart city is finance, do we have the money to do something, governance, do we have the wherewithal to do it, and third is culture, do we have the culture of experimentation that allows us to go down these paths, do the experiment, and if we fail, learn from it, and we succeed, propagate it uh, across the city. And as a city, Toronto, we don't have the finances. We have a history of uh, not solving that problem. From a governance point of view, it's a dog's breakfast. And from a culture point of view, we know that the previous administration left us with a culture of keeping your head buried in the sand so that uh, the Ford brothers would knock it off. So I think that generally we tend to fail on all three of those dimensions. Sidewalk gives us the first opportunity in which we can actually begin to push those dimensions from financial governance and culture changing way. And to the extent that we forget that and not treat this as an experiment along those dimensions and other dimensions, whatever the hypotheses are, again, I don't think the out, no matter how good the outcome is, it will not be perceived as good as it is. So that's my, my comment about um, sidewalk. Uh, I'm not going to return to sidewalk at all. Actually, I will indirect it. So what I'm going to talk about next is what is a smart city? Um, I went to the um, bookstore and I looked for a beanie with a propeller on it uh, because I guess I'm the propeller head amongst the group here, so uh, I might as well wear the uh, clothing. So what is a smart city? People have a lot of expectations about what I'm going to say given my background, and so they'll, they'll probably think me saying something like, composed of a system of systems, acting as an organic whole with information and computer. Uh, communication technology providing an artificial nervous system. This is due to Cantor and, and Littau back in 2009. They, they normally expect me to say that. And I do say that uh, periodically when there's a very narrow crowd focusing on technology. Um, but when you have me talking about smart cities in general, I like to actually focus on the major problems as opposed to the minor problems. Um, and so my preferred version of smart cities, and this is due to Harrison 2014, is cities are regions that seek to make the best use of the knowledge and intelligence of citizens, administrators, and service providers to improve the design, construction, and operation of the city in various ways. It says nothing about technology. You don't need technology to be smart. I mean, we just need to be smart enough to figure out how to improve things. I mean, if you look at the sidewalk proposal, find one idea that is new. 
one idea. I dare you to find one idea that is new. Every idea that I've seen in the sidewalk proposal, I've seen elsewhere, and I've seen over the decades. I mean, you talk about modular uh, housing, the German architects for decades have been designing modular uh, buildings. I mean, and I'm not an architect. Matter of fact, I didn't, back then I didn't do anything with urban uh, problems, but I know about it. Um, you know, we look at you know moving uh, boxes, products, services underground. Who's been to Chicago? Ruben, we know, has been to Chicago. <laughs> Who's been to Chicago? Wacker Drive or whatever it is. Two levels. The lower level is services. The upper level is pedestrian. Okay, the ideas are already there. Go to Japan. Go to Tokyo. You'll see the multiple levels of, of uh, infrastructure that is there too. Um, it's not. What's interesting about the sidewalk experiment is an organization given the opportunity to take the best ideas that people are pursuing on a global basis and be given the opportunity to bring it together as opposed to just focusing on one little piece of the puzzle. Okay? Because if we turn to a company like Cisco or IBM, what are they going to sell you? Cisco's going to sell you routers. Okay? They're not going to sell you an urban solution. And what's unique about the sidewalk example is it's urban-led as opposed to technology-led in, in what they're trying to do. So yeah, I, mean, I do come back to the sidewalk uh, uh, experiment. Anyway. Um, the pragmatic version of what a smart city is is due to a uh, pool at the Guardian in 2014. Competing visions of the smart city are proxies for competing visions of society, in particular, who holds power in society. And I think the example you gave of the Brothers Ford was a, a good one of uh, that example. Who holds the power? In that case, they didn't have the power. So, for me, it's all about people. It's not about technology. Okay? And, uh, so let me stop there on the definitions of a smart city. Let me now go, uh, let me now talk about a leap of faith that is probably held by um, most of you in this room. And the leap of faith is very simple. That is, you read about artificial intelligence. Now, um, my background is artificial intelligence. I've been doing it since 1974. So I, I tend to know a little bit about it. Uh, and you read in a newspaper. As a matter of fact, I started a company back in the 80s with the first wave and took it public and all that type of stuff. So I've been through this wave of AI over and over again. Um, but we take a leap of faith. And we take a leap of faith that the technology is available to create a smart city. Okay, and where do we base that leap of faith on? Okay, you had some miracle must have occurred that led you to take that leap of faith. What was the, what was the uh, miracle? Neural nets, the Vector Institute, autonomous vehicles, okay? Siri or whatever it is that understands me on the phone. Everything around you is forcing you to take this leap of faith. Okay, let's think about it. First, I'll deal with the autonomous vehicle. How many here believe that autonomous vehicles will be available within the next five to ten years? Okay. Uh, ten to twenty? Okay, good, we get enough. So within twenty years we'll have autonomous vehicles. Uber, there's something called in the autonomous vehicle world, and we haven't even defined what autonomous means. To me, autonomous means totally self-driving. It'll drive anywhere around the city under any conditions uh, without any human intervention. And so one metric that's used in the autonomous vehicle world is mean time to intervention. So you know these autonomous vehicles have a driver sitting beside the, uh, behind the wheel, and if there's something that's going to occur, like an accident, they then intervene. Okay, so they refer to mean time to intervention. How many hours is that car driving itself without anybody intervening? For Uber, it's about 1,000 hours mean time to intervention. That is, the car is going to do something that you don't want it to do and you have to humanly intervene. Google is about 5,000 hours. Anybody want to hazard a guess what it is for a human being? 1.2 million. Okay, now think about that. We have a long way to go before we have full autonomy. We don't know how to do full autonomy. Okay? We, and where full autonomy is not just being able to stay in the lane, not just being able to park the car, not just being able to stop at a red light, 
but dealing with the fact that the dog is about to jump out of the window or somebody uh, jumped off a building in front of you or whatever it is. And it was interesting, the um, Ethics and AI presentation, uh, Hector Lebec, uh, who actually started as an undergrad at the same time I did in computer science here way back before I can even remember. Um, anyway, he talked about the long tail of uh, uh, low probability events. The world is full of low probability events. We don't have the training data for that, okay, to allow a car to learn enough using neural nets what to do. And, but you read about it and you buy into it. You drink the Kool-Aid, okay? You're convinced it's going to happen, okay? It's not gonna happen as quickly as you think. The beauty about the sidewalk situation is you can design that little neighborhood. So a lot of these long tail, low probability events are designed out of it. It used to be the case, no, it's not used to be the case. It's always the case when I give a presentation on urban problems that I say to people, when we refer to a very difficult problem, we refer to it as you know rocket science or neurosurgery. Okay, I have a bit of an engineering back, background. Rocket science is easy in comparison to cities. And the reason why it's easy is we design out all the exogenous variables. We simplify, to the problem, we simplify the problem to the point that we actually know how to solve it. Whereas in cities, you can't do that. All the complications are there, and you're not going to get rid of them. The complexity of the urban environment is so vast that it's incomprehensible. And that's why we have all these disciplines. That's why Mariana focuses on criminology. I focus on another area. I can't put my head around everything that goes on in the city. Anyway, um, so from these small little examples you've convinced yourself, uh, we've taken the leap of faith that the technology is there to build a smart city. Okay, I can build a smart street lamp. Okay, I can build an app that tells you if the subway or the, the bus is gonna be coming around the corner. You know, so that's easy stuff. We don't do that in academia, okay? It's not a problem. It's just implementation of these artifacts. What's really a problem is a system of systems that we call cities, okay? What's really a problem is that cities are complex and have a high level of uncertainty. We don't know what's gonna happen an hour in the future. We don't know what's going to happen a minute in the future. Okay, we think we can, but we don't. And I remember a quote. I was doing some work with Boeing aircraft years ago, and they they were characterizing what a 747 aircraft was to me. And they said it's a million parts flying in close formation. Okay, <laughs> and what that says to you is. There's a high degree of uncertainty even in what they do, and so they over, over design it to make sure it's not going to fall apart in the sky. Okay? The city is composed of thousands of individuals, whether those individuals, tens of thousands, whatever, hundreds of thousands, millions of individuals and software systems and, and mechanical systems all operating in parallel, all interacting in very interesting ways and operating in loose coordination. Okay. And the laws imposed by society, subject to some other laws. What are some of those other laws? Murphy's Law, what can go wrong, will go wrong. Okay. Do we design that into our systems? No, we don't design it. Multi's Law, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. All the things we know is true, we, we throw away with our leap of faith. Uh, Billings Law, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and my law, which is there will always be people who will work the system to their own benefit, or for every rule there's someone who's ready to break it. Okay? This is reality. This is what cities are all about. And if you come into the smart city world with the assumption that you have the ability to control, manage, monitor this complex system called a city, you're drinking more than Kool-Aid. I mean, we're on the vodka side. We're going to get on that. <laughs> so in order for us to build a smart city, this is really what the technical point I wanted to make, is knowing that I have a camera and that I have a neural net that can recognize your face doesn't make me a smart city. It makes me a smarter. 
face recognition system. Okay? <laughs> Knowing that the city lights turn off and on when they need to be turned off and on doesn't make a smart city. It makes smart lights. Okay? A smart city is one that addresses the full set of subsystems, all the pieces, and figures out ways to do things better as a system as opposed to these individual parts. Now, it's nice to have smart street lights, smart lighting, smart this, smart that, but it ignores the whole fact that we are an interconnected system and it's all interacting with each other. <coughs> but we say, hey, you computer scientists, you know what you're doing. You got all these data systems, you got all these uh, fiber optic connections, we're gathering all this data, we're going to do wonderful things with this data. We don't even know how to integrate the data. Okay? When people talk about open data portals for cities, that data isn't integrated. What's integrated is the portal. You have the opportunity to access separate data sets that are not integrated in any way. So I teach a course in, in uh, data analytics in cities, in the civil engineering city program. And I say to the students right when they start, okay, you're gonna solve a city problem using data analytics. And I'll tell you right now, it's gonna take you 80% of your time to figure out what the data is and how to get it to actually integrate that I can combine data from multiple sources. And 20% of the time, you're gonna be doing a data analytics. And the reason is the data that the cities generate is not designed at the outset so they can be integrated properly. So I'll, I'll, I'll say something from Mariana's side of the world, okay? For the longest time, criminal data was done in cities like Toronto on a neighborhood basis or on the police station basis, whatever their responsible area was, okay? How do I combine that? How do I use that data that's reported within one geographic area with data that's reported on a neighborhood area, with data that's reported on a census area? And I'm talking about the simplest integration of data because it's already aggregated for me and it's done at a geographic level where they're not the same geographies, okay? Mm -hmm. It's very simple. That's the simplest problem I could even think of. I mean, we know what the solution is. Give me that long, you know, give me the actual geographic location. I can then take it to the neighborhood and stuff like that. So there are solutions for that. But I got lots of examples where there's no solution. You can't integrate the data. So, Beneath, beneath our feet, the data that's beneath our feet, you make this assumption that we, you know, oh, get out this data, we can integrate it, do all sorts of evidence-based reasoning, you know, it's tough. Okay, and the problems haven't been solved. But I'm gonna throw another problem at you. Okay, let's go back to the city of system and systems. Sorry, I'm not taking too long. So, so let's go back to the systems uh, view of the world. What is going to be the thing that operates the city. I mean, nobody thinks about that. Okay, what is going to be the primary method by which we interact with the city going forward? And it's becoming so today. It's the web, right? You want a service, you go on the web. You want information, you go on the web. You want to buy something, you go on the web. Whatever it is that you do, you're going to do it on the web. You're going to interact with the city, you're going to do it via the web. You're not going to speak to people. In the long run, you're not going to speak to people. So in essence, whatever that operating system is that runs the city is your primary interface. Okay? That system will be the way you connect with the city. Okay? Because that'll be the primary interface. And what does that say? Let me bring this to an ethics point of view. And I had to go and look up what ethics means. I mean, I thought I knew what ethics is, but... Uh, uh, I had to look it up anyway. I think the definition is really important. Ethics definition, the dictionary I looked at, is moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. What's going to be the principles, the moral principles, that govern the behavior of the city operating system? To me, that's the ethical issue. Okay? We can talk about data all you want, and I knew that this was going to be reduced to data because everybody who writes about it, Actually, I only found one paper on that, on smart cities and ethics, and they write about data. Um, I hate to say this to everybody, but the issue of privacy, that horse bolted from the barn 15, 20 years ago. From a computer science perspective, we lost that war, if you want to refer to it as a war, a long time ago. Okay, And it doesn't matter 
how much you think we can do from putting in uh, firewalls and saying, here's the privacy legislation. You give so much information about yourself out on an hourly basis that whatever we need to get, we can eventually get if we're willing to put the time into it. So the issue isn't about, I mean, not to say that we shouldn't have firewalls, not to say that we shouldn't have security, not to say that we shouldn't have privacy, but that isn't the total solution. It's just one piece of the puzzle. And so what I'm talking about isn't about privacy because it's an important question, but everybody talks about that. But what they lose sight of the fact is that as we begin to automate the system that operates the city, actually makes decisions, decides where to allocate resources, when to do things, who to do it for, how to prioritize what it's going to work on, as that becomes more automated, where is the ethical basis of that system? Where is the accountability of that system? Where do we make it change from being process oriented, which is the way all systems are today, to being goal oriented, so that the goals are being achieved and not just implementing process independent of the goal. To me, these are the ethical questions that have to be addressed. That's it. All right, thank you very much.